G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Another Tech Tuesday for the 6th of November 2018. And today, I'm talking about capacitors. Now, I said I was going to talk about accelerometers, but I've decided to leave that till next week because then we do something different. You know, change is as good as a holiday. Let's have a holiday. Let's change. Let's talk about something that's really quite simple. It is what we call a passive component. And they're one of the building blocks of all the electronic devices that we have in the hobby. Capacitors are an essential building block. The basic, the basic passives are capacitors, resistors, and inductors. And they're called passives because they just lie around doing nothing. They, they don't have any active elements. That is to say, they are, well, what would you say? They don't amplify anything. They, they simply change the way the electricity flows, but they don't change it in an active way. They passively change it. That didn't explain the damn thing, did it? Never mind, let's move on. Capacitors. And this is the circuit diagram for a capacitor, or this, the, el the symbol for a capacitor in a circuit diagram. And it tells us a lot about capacitors, actually, because what capacitors are really is just two plates of conductive material separated by an insulator. That insulator can be air, it can be plastic, it can be a liquid, uh, it just it can be an oxide of metal, it can be anything that doesn't conduct electricity, which is basically what an insulator is, isn't it? So that's what a capacitor is. Um, capacitors are measured, there's two values for a capacitor. One is the voltage rating, because as you can see, if this is a um, got an insulator in here and you put voltage on one side and the other voltage, you know, like positive on here and negative on there, if you put enough voltage, then a spark will jump through air or even with a plastic insulator, the plastic will break down and you'll get electricity jumping between the plates and that's when they fail, that can produce a short circuit. So you need to rate the voltage, the maximum voltage a capacitor can handle. If you use a, voltage, a capacitor with too low a voltage rating, then the insulating layer will break down and sometimes magic smoke will come out. So the voltage rating is probably, you know, in terms of Longevity, that's a really important thing. Now, the other rating is the capacity of the capacitor. They're called capacitors because they have a capacity. Um, and that's measured in farads. That's the unit of measurement. But a farad is a huge amount of capacity. So normally we talk about them in things like um, microfarads, nanofarads, or picofarads. So they're all tiny fractions of a farad. Obviously, if you look up those, those prefixes, you'll work out what they are. You know, micro is one millionth, um, nano is one billionth, and pico is one thousand billionth or whatever. So, um, yeah, so we're usually dealing with very small amounts. Now, um, when I say farads, you know, you don't usually have farads. Well, it's actually sometimes you do, because there is a thing called a super cap, which is a really, 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 just check my notes, really high capacity capacitor. And sometimes they're measured in farads. I'll talk about those a bit more in a moment. But here we go. There's a capacitor. There's the symbol. And how do they work? Well, I'll just show you. Basically, they are like a reservoir of electricity. You, you can temporarily store electricity in a capacitor and then pull it out again. That's one of the most common uses for a capacitor. They act as a reservoir of electricity. Now, not like a battery, though, because batteries don't store electrons. They store chemical energy. They convert the flow of electricity into a chemical energy that can then be reversed and therefore the electrons come back out again, making an electrical circuit. So these have no chemical actions at all. Capacitors are completely passive. There's no chemical reactions. It's just a buildup of electrons on one plate and a lack of electrons on the other plate. So if we were to connect this up to a battery, let's say we had a battery here, it had a positive terminal and a negative terminal, and we ran a wire from the positive to there and from the negative to there, what would happen here is actually really interesting. Opposites attract. That's why ugly women like me, okay? Um, but opposites attract. So what happens here is, on the positive terminal here, that will actually attract, normally speaking, you've got electrons on both sides of these plates, right? Just a few electrons. Um, if you connect it up to a battery, the electrons on this plate are attracted to the positive terminal. So you end up losing electrons from this plate. And, and, because of the way things are going, electricity flows in a circuit. So you have electrons traveling up this wire and you have extra electrons arriving on that plate. So you have a capacitor that is charged with electrons. They're stored, the plates control, hold the electrons. No chemical stuff, it's just raw electrons stored inside your capacitor. And, and that has a number of benefits over a battery, obviously because chemical reactions break down over time. You know, chemistry, the, the, for example, let's take a lead acid battery. Um, the, the acid goes, you know, gets contaminated. The lead um, forms sulfates and then breaks down forms a layer on the bottom which shorts out the place. So many things, bad things can happen with batteries, but with a capacitor, <laughs> there's nothing chemical happening, so they would, in theory, last a long, 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 long time. Um, they don't always, they'll get onto that. 
later on. But uh, also because you're not having to wait for a chemical reaction to take place. You know when you charge a LiPo, you charge it at 1C, and it takes an hour, it takes over an hour to actually charge that battery, because you can't charge it too fast. If you tried to charge it at 100C, it would explode, because the electrons would rush in, the chemical reaction would take place, but then it takes place so quickly that gas is liberated, that the electrolyte in the battery boils, and then the gas pressurizes it, and then boom, you've got a big explosion. With a capacitor, none of that carry on. It'll accept electrons as, as, as quickly as you like, the limit being basically the wires that connect in the plates, if they just pass too much current, they'll get hot and melt. That's really the, the basic limit. So you can charge capacitors really quickly, and you can discharge them really quickly. Um, which brings us to this thing, ESR, what's that? It's called effective series resistance. Now, as I mentioned, um, the only limiting factor in charging a capacitor is how much current the wires and the plates can handle before they become fuses and melt. And because everything that conducts electricity, apart from superconductors, and we're not going there, has a resistance. So in theory, if we were to draw this, there's actually what we call a parasitic resistance in the capacitor, if this is our capacitor. There's a resistor in there, and that's actually just the resistance of the wires and the plates. And what happens is that resistance can reduce the efficiency of the capacitor to take large amounts of current and deliver large amounts of current. So where we want to do that, we want to be able to charge it and discharge it very quickly, have it handle very high flows of current in and out. We need a capacitor which has a low effective series resistance. That's this thing in here. And that enables it to work far more efficiently in those high current, high flow situations. And one of those is, let me show you when you'd use a high ESR capacitor. Actually, I mean a low ESR capacitor, a capacitor, a capacitor with a low effective series resistance, one that looks um, able to handle lots of current. Here is a typical setup when you might want to use a capacitor. This is a battery, LiPo. There's an ESC, there's your motor. Yeah, it's pretty standard stuff, isn't it? Now, here's, as well as powering the ESC and the motor, the battery may be providing voltage to a video transmitter and a camera. Let's put an aerial on that video transmitter before it burns out. There we go. Um, and bad things can happen here. Now, this, if you were around in the early days of mini quads and things, you'll know that it was very common to get really bad lines on the video. When you had your motors, when you did a punch out or something, the video would go all crappy. There'd be lines all the way through it. The reason for that is that inside the ESC, there are little tiny solid state switches called FETs, which we'll cover in a future video, which are basically turning off and on the current going to the windings around the uh, around the motor, on the stator of the motor. So those voltage, those currents are being switched very, very quickly. And that means the load on the battery through the ESC is varying quite significantly. As one coil gets turned on, there's more current drawn, and then it gets turned off and another one gets turned on. And with batteries, as we probably already know, when you put a load on a battery, the voltage drops. It's natural. It's just because, again, there's a parasitic resistor inside the battery, you know, and that's the internal resistance of the battery. And when you put a load on it, some of the voltage gets dropped across that internal resistance. It's not a real resistor. It's a theoretical one, but the voltage disappears across there. So if we were to put an oscilloscope here, let's have a look. Let's get an oscilloscope. I should actually do this on the bench, shouldn't I? Okay. And here is the oscilloscope. Let's put a knob on it. You can't have oscilloscopes without knobs. And if you were to run some leads out, one onto there and one onto there. So you're going to measure the voltage across your battery and going into your video transmitter. Now, when you give this thing some herbs, open up the throttle, boom, and the motor starts spinning, and the ESC is switching the voltage or the currents really, really quickly. The voltage looks, normally we'd have like a, a 12 volts, so it's a three cell pack, 12 volts straight line. So over time that voltage doesn't change. But when you actually start putting a whole lot of uh, load on it and start running the motor, as the voltage switches off and on, you get, you get a buggered felt pin. Let's find one that works, shall we? You get voltage that goes like this. You see that's going up and down because every time a magnet, electromagnet switched on through the ESC, it pulls the voltage down. When it's switched off, the voltage goes up. Next one gets switched on, so it goes down, up and down, and down. So we get all this, this wavy, wave form, wavy lines there, which are noise on the voltage, right? Caused by the ESC. And that feeds through into the video transmitter and the camera, and you get lines all over your picture. But you can fix that to a huge degree because you take your good old friendly capacitor, put it on there. And what happens then? When the voltage drops temporarily here because the, the battery is having extra current drawn, well, first of all, let's say you've got it turned on, right? And this charges up. So this charges up to 12 volts. The capacitor's all charged up across the battery. Suddenly, the, motor, the ESC draws a lot of current to drive the motor, and the battery can't provide enough current. It 
can't on its own because it's got that resistance. So the voltage starts to drop in the battery. Well, this also provides current out here to meet the need. So it's like a backup battery, but it's a very, very fast battery, and it can provide very, very high amounts of current for a very short period of time. If we look at the noise, that's exactly what we need because we have little dips, but they're very short drops in voltage as things are switching. So if the capacitor can fill in those gaps, you end up with the capacitor handling all these gaps here. I hope I've got enough resolution on the camera for that. So it basically takes you back to a smooth line and all the noise disappears. So this is a, a good way to think about this. I'll show you another analogy. It's a brilliant analogy. I'm good at those. This is how a capacitor works in that situation. Here's a car engine, there's the radiator, and there's the little plastic tank that you have, which takes the overflow from the radiator. It's like the, I don't know what you call it, but it's the, the overflow tank anyway. This is the engine out of my Bugatti Veyron. It's a W10 engine, I think. Um, but you know, it could be any engine, water cooled. So what happens is here, when, you, when the system is sitting there cold, everything's fine. Now you start up the motor, the engine, start the engine up, it gets hot. And so therefore the water in the cooling system expands. It expands, but there's only a finite space for it to be. And so what happens is, it's designed so that as the water expands, the excess flows through a tube into a little plastic bottle. So starting off, and this tube goes right down to the bottom. Starting off, you might have this much water in the bottle. Once the engine is warmed up, you can have this much because the water's expanded inside the cooling system. Right, so that's fine. So the excess water goes out into that bottle. That's like charging up our capacitor from the battery. The, you know, basically, the, the cooling system has charged up that bottle. Now, what happens is when you turn the motor off, turn the engine off, everything starts to cool down. And again, the water shrinks, but it's in a fixed thing. So what happens is as the water in the radiator and the block of the engine gets smaller, it starts sucking the excess water back out of that overflow bottle into the radiator so you don't end up with the radiator you know, being short of water. And that's what the capacitor does. When the voltage from our battery drops because there's a huge load from the motor, the capacitor provides the extra Volt, extra, extra power needed to fill in the gaps. So it makes sure that we never run dry. It provides, fills in the gaps, fills in the bumps on the noise. I might show you, I'll try and do an experiment on the bench. If I do, here it is. And here we are at the bench. Now what I've got here, let me show you what I've set up here. I've got my oscilloscope and um, I've got a power supply over here which is doing 10 volts. So this signal there, if I wind the voltage up and down, you'll see woo, 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 that line goes up and down. That is our DC. And if I turn this off completely, You'll see it goes right down to the bottom once the voltage has bled away. There we go. So that's zero volts. That's 10 volts, right? Or well, 9.8 at the moment. Doesn't matter. But that's the DC. That's our battery. Let's say our battery is putting this voltage out. Now suddenly our motor starts going. So it's starting to draw all sorts of um, current from the battery. So we'll get, and I'll turn this on, you'll see what happens in a moment. Oh, I forgot to set it. Hang on. Let's go over. I oh, shall set up the here we go, there is the noise that appears on the top of our DC. So it's still, it's not AC because zero volts is down here. So it's just a noise on top of the DC. This is the noise generated, we've simulated it, that our ESC would generate. And that would make lines all over our FPV gear, make it look really crap. So how do we fix that? How do we fix that? Well, ta-da, Mr. Capacitor. Mr. Capacitor comes to the party. I'm going to put this capacitor across the battery and let's see what it does to that noise component up there. So we'll put it on here and on there. Look, it's effectively almost removed it. Take it off, put the, capac put the capacitor on, the noise goes away, take the capacitor off, noise comes back. So this is effectively filling in the highs and lows by absorbing the high electricity and feeding it back out when the voltage drops down. So that's how we remove noise using a capacitor. And you've seen it for yourself, it must be true, it was on the oscilloscope. Now here's another really cool thing about capacitors and another place they're used very often, and that is separating AC from DC. Now DC is direct current, that's just like a battery, and the it's just current, one voltage, and it just goes around the circle or wherever through the circuitry. It's just a direct current, it doesn't, it doesn't um, change polarity, it stays the same polarity. Alternating current, however, goes backwards and forwards. We have AC in our houses. If you're in America, you've got 110 volts AC. If you're in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, you, you pay more, so you get 220 volts AC. And that means that the voltage just changes up and down. What I've drawn here is a picture that's quite normal. Here's, say, 12 volts, and we've got a wiggly line. So this particular, this is our oscilloscope, of course, this is voltage, this is time. So on this signal here, we've got an AC waveform superimposed on a DC voltage because the actual voltage never goes below zero, but it does go up and down. 
So you might say, oh, we only want the AC component. Let's say we're coupling a video camera to a video transmitter. Um, somewhere in there, you might find that you want to change it from being like this to just being pure AC. So what you do is you do this. If we put, this is the waveform that we'd see here. So it's got DC coming out here. There's 12 volts on here. And it's got that signal on the top. You just want the AC out here. You put a capacitor in there. If we drew this graph again, 12 volts, zero, then what you'd get is this. You've still got that wiggly line, but it's down at zero volts. It's taken out the DC because capacitors block DC. Capacitors do not allow direct current to flow. I'll show you with the meter on the bench. If we put a meter on or put a capacitor in a circuit, nothing happens. No current flows if it's DC. Nothing happens at all because the DC can't travel. Because remember, capacitor is two plates with an insulator in between. So the current can't flow through the insulator. Simple as that. Um, that's how we can extract an AC signal from a situation where it has a DC component. And getting a bit complex here, but basically that happens a lot in uh, signal processing, receivers and audio amplifiers, stuff like that. Video stuff, we need to you know, isolate those two components. So let's take a look at the different types of capacitors, the way they're made, and as I say, basically all of them are two plates with an insulator in between. But the way they're physically, way, the way they're physically made varies significantly, and the size and everything varies significantly, because if, obviously if you've got a capacitor that's designed to handle very high voltages, the insulator must be quite thick. Um, therefore, it's going to be a bulkier capacitor. If you only have to deal with like six volts, you can make the insulator so super, super thin that you can make the capacitor really, really small. So there are a number of the most common capacitors we use in the um, hobby today, or the manufacturers use, are what we call ceramic. Ceramic capacitors, they're little square block things, they mount on the surface mount components, they fit on the circuit board. I'll put a picture of one up here, hopefully. Um, and it just looks like a little rectangle, little block with little silver ends. And if, but if we were to look at it, cross-section it, so here's our ceramic capacitor. It has a silver end there and a silver end there. And it goes onto a circuit board. Normally the circuit board is like that. And you'll see the solder there and solder there. That's how they fit. Now, inside here, very, very clever. What they've got is from each end, there are little plates come out like this. And they, like, they go like fingers and link up together so like this, if you imagine that, like that. And so therefore, you can see the whole plate thing. You've got a plate, you've got an insulator, plate, insulator, plate, insulator. So because they are dealing with usually fairly low voltages, generally less than 25 volts, the, the insulator, the ceramic that insulates those, mat, those plates is very, very, very thin. And that means the whole capacitor can be really small. Another benefit is that it'll work either way around. You can, you can doesn't matter whether you put positive on this end, and negative on there, or whether you do the reverse and have negative on there and positive on there. They don't care about polarity, they're just independent. And so these are very common, very popular. They're quite, they're quite tough, but they can be broken with sudden shock because ceramic is a bit brittle sometimes. So, but they are the, the, the backbone of modern electronics. And you get them from, from a few hundred picofarads up to um, several microfarads. So they cover a wide range. And generally, the more, farad, more microfarads you've got, the bigger they are. So some are quite big, some are quite small. That's ceramic. Um, as I say, they're just a component you'll find on a circuit board. Now, the other type that you'll find very, very commonly is something called an electrolytic. And I'll draw a picture of one here. Well, I'm very crap at drawing. Um, and they just got like a little can. They've got two wire legs down at the bottom. That's the normal, that's what they call a through-hole version. And they're very interesting because they're different to ceramic. They're different to ceramic because, first of all, they have a polarity. You can only use them one way around. If you put them around the other way, bad things happen. But the electrolytics are very cheap to make, and they can have quite high capacities. So that's why you commonly find them when you're looking at values of let's say 100, you know, 50 microfarads or bigger, generally you'll find an electrolytic capacitor. And the way they're built is stunningly clever. If you were to look inside here, you'll find that, let's just do a, a cross section from the top. Here's the can. If we took, cut the cut off the top of the can, you would find that there was a spiral of metal foil like that and another spiral of metal foil like that. Well, if I can get it right. So, so there's two layers of metal foil that are wound into a spiral, and then there's a liquid in there. Why is it, 
liquid. What's a liquid for? The liquid is part of the whole construction. And I'm going to show you um, in a much simplified form how this all works. Right. Here is one plate of our electrolytic capacitor, part of that spiral, and here is the other one. And of course, these go off, this will go off to my plus, and this will go off to minus. And obviously, you've got the can in there, so we just assume that this is a thing. And there is a liquid in here. So what happens is these are aluminium, usually aluminium. There can be other metals, but aluminium is the most common. You can have tantalum, and I think there's nobium as well. But aluminium electrolytics are the most common. And what happens is when a current is passed, a forming current is passed through this capacitor, you get anodizing takes place. Anodizing is a really cool thing too. It converts aluminium into aluminium oxide. And aluminium conducts electricity really well. Aluminium oxide doesn't conduct it at all. So when you do this, if you pass a current through here, a very, 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 very thin layer of oxide, if I've got a different colored pen, yeah, see if this one will work. Very, very thin layer of oxide, as thin as my pen here, forms around this electrode. And it becomes an insulator. Suddenly, the electricity can't flow anymore. And of course, it's a perfect capacitor because the capacitance of a capacitor is determined by two things, the area of those plates and how close they are together. So the bigger the plates, the more capacity. And the closer you can get them together without them touching and electricity flowing, then the higher the capacity you get. So what they do here is by using a oxide, it's only a few atoms thick, a few molecules thick on the surface of the thing. Um, and also remember, because this electrolyte here is a conductor, it conducts electricity. Effectively, you've got the, the negative within a few atoms of the positive plate. And so you get massive, massive amounts of capacity in a really small space. So that's why we use electrolytics. It enables us to make really, really high capacity capacitors in a fairly small space. That's the secret of it. So they are very, very common where you need a lot of capacity. Now, obviously, because that's such a very thin film of oxide, the voltage rating is very, very critical. If you exceed the voltage rating, then that film will break down and bad things will happen because effectively you've shorted out your capacitor because the electrolyte will still have the negative and this will be positive with nothing separating them. So the current will flow and boom, because <laughs> these things go bang. I uh, trust me, if you get, if you get a failure inside an electrolytic capacitor, they explode. And for that reason, if you look at the top, I'll try and overlay a picture. This is the top of the can. You'll find that there's some little grooves, little things cut in the top of the can. That's because it provides safe venting. If something does go wrong in this shorts out and this liquid, this electrolyte starts boiling because of all the electrical energy flowing through it, then these little grooves there will split and the top of the cam will open up rather than the whole thing exploding and creating a danger. That's the theory, it'll just split. And you can often tell if an electrolytic capacitor is faulty because instead of having a perfectly flat top, let me show you what, you know, so like this. Instead of having a perfectly flat top, they dome up. They start doming up because what's happened is that the liquid in here has turned to gas and it's pressurized it. And if you see that, that capacitor is buggered. Even if it's working now, it'll be stuffed in a very short period of time, so you replace it. So electrolytic capacitors, they are fantastic, but they do have a finite lifetime because where the wires come in, there's usually a rubber seal down here and, and stuff gets past the rubber seals. And over time, the, electroly the, the electrolyte gets, breaks down and gets contaminated. And so they don't last forever. They're not like the ceramic cats, which in theory will last forever. Electrolytics. Not so good. And there is another form of electrolytic capacitor called a tantalum, which is quite common in our little stuff. It's usually a little orange rectangle. And I'll show you some of those uh, on the bench. And they are also very high capacity for a very small space. In fact, higher capacity than the aluminium ones because the tantalum oxide film is even thinner than the aluminium oxide film. But they also are very prone to failure. If you put too much voltage on them, they turn black and smoke and flames come roaring out. Woo, great fun. And you might have noticed that if you've ever connected a battery around the wrong way to a receiver, probably the smoke was caused by the tantalum capacitors that are sitting across the battery input to smooth out the noise that might come from your ESC or whatever, as we mentioned earlier. Isn't that simple? Now, there is another type of capacitor called a plastic film capacitor, sometimes called a mylar capacitor, sometimes called a polyester capacitor. That's describing the type of plastic film that separates the plates. I've drawn the thing here. I mean, here we go. There's one plate. Usually that's a foil. It's kind of a, usually an aluminium foil. So you get a foil plate and a foil plate and a plastic sheet separating them. And then they wind them all up, screw them up into a little ball, and then they're small enough to use on a circuit board. I've actually made one. I made one myself out of kitchen foil and kitchen film. 
And let's go to the bench and I'll show you, we'll measure it, it has a capacity, and I'll show you another really interesting um, thing associated with these capacitors and how it goes back to the video I did last week about MEMS devices. Let's go to the bench and look at that now. And here is my homemade capacitor, I promised you. Here we go, look. What I've got here is two, two sheets of aluminium foil or aluminium foil if you live in the USA, just kitchen foil, and some plastic which is separating those sheets. So we have two plates and an insulator. The insulator is just this kitchen film, this cling film, separating the two sheets. So now I've got my multimeter, and most reasonable multimeters have a capacitance scale. You see it's that little capacitor symbol, so you know that's what it is. So let's go onto there, and we'll measure my capacitor. Right, now, because we've got wires close together, we've got a capacitor, there's what we call residual parasitic capacitance in this. We need to get rid of that. I press this button here, and it will zero. Will it? Go on. There we go, I didn't press it hard enough. Zero. So now I'm going to measure my capacitor by putting one probe on there and one probe on there. And it should tell me that, woo, we've got 17 nanofarads in our capacitor. There you go, so that's a 17 nanofarad capacitor there. Not a very good one, but it's there. Now I'm going to show you something else. Remember last week I talked about the MEMS devices and how they used, a, they had a capacitor in there which varied in value because the plates came closer and further apart due to the Coriolis effect. Now, I'm going to show you how that works. So let's measure our capacitor. Try and get my probes on here fairly evenly. Okay, there we go. We've got 16, roughly, roughly 17 to 18. Oh, it's going up a bit because I'm pressing hard. I won't press so hard. There we go, 17 um, nanofarads. You watch what happens when I press on my capacitor. Woo! Shot up to 43, 45. Take my hand off. Goes back down to 17 or 18. Press again. Now, why is that capacity changing? Well, it's changing because I'm pushing the plates closer together because there's air between the plates. Now, this is just, it's not tightly wound. So when I press the air out and push the plates closer together, still separated by the plastic film, the dielectric, the capacitance goes up, and that's how the MEMS device works. As the two parts of the MEMS device get closer together, the capacity goes up, and when they go further apart, the capacity falls down. So that's how they measure it. Um, no electrical conduction or con connection required, it's just a capacitance thing. So you could build your own capacitive touchpad, and that's how, um, you, roughly how your capacitive touchscreen works on your cell phone too. There you go. Isn't that simple? There you go, and make your own capacitor. Now, I'll show you something here which is going to surprise you, it's going to shock you. Now that's my roughly 15 or 18 nanofarad capacitor, but Remember I talked about ceramic capacitors and how effective they are and how small? Well, let's have a look. Here's a 15 nanofarad. Let me just pull in a bit here so you can see. Okay, there they are. Here's my finger as a size comparison. Here are the meter probes as a size comparison. That has got the same, those little, each one of those individual components has the same capacity as my honking great handmade 17 or 18 nanofarad capacitor here. So you can see that how do they get so much capacity in a small device? Well, obviously the plates are much smaller than these plates, but they're so much closer together that you get a high capacity or matching capacity. So if I put this in a vise and scrunched it really tightly, I'd probably get, I may even get um, a couple of hundred nanofarads of capacity out of that homemade capacitor. But by doing it with a ceramic substrate, very, very thin, very, very small spacings, they can get it out of a tiny, tiny little device like that. And finally, Another place we use resistors sometimes is in determining timings, um, oscillators and things, because one of the interesting things about a capacitor is that, uh, as I mentioned, they will charge really quickly, but if you put a resistor in series with a capacitor, it'll limit the rate at which it charges, because obviously the, the current is reduced by having to pass through a resistor. So instead of just charging that up instantly, it takes a while to charge up. And that time it takes is something called the RC constant, or the RC, it's a resistance times the capacitance. And that enables us to do things like cal calculate and build circuits that will um, trigger a certain thing to happen at a certain time. Now if we look at, um, here's our oscilloscope, connected across that capacitor with a resistance in there, what happens is we get something that looks like this. As you can see, it takes time as, that, as slowly the capacitor charges up. This is the voltage, this is time. So the capacitor doesn't just suddenly charge right up, it takes time to charge up. So if you have something here, so we have a threshold here. At this point here, if we decide that that's going to turn on a transistor or something, then that's the time that it takes to do it. If we double the capacitance, or if we halve the capacitance, then obviously that would charge more quickly, and the 
thing would go there if we change the resistance value. So we can use a combination of capacitors and resistors to, to develop time periods and use those time periods to switch stuff off and on. Not so common these days in the world of digital, but back in the analog days, it was a very, very common way to create a timer or something like that, just charge a capacitor and wait till it gets to a certain voltage. When it hits that voltage, something happens, bing, and you can vary this resistance. If you make this a variable resistor, you can then tweak a knob to change the time frame. Darkroom timers, a lot of people just make darkroom timers way back in the old days, as simple as that. You know, when you used to use film and cameras, you need to have a certain amount of time before you took out the film or the um, exposure out of this tank and put in another one. Same thing there. You just tweak a little knob and it would take a certain amount of time to charge the capacitor. There you go. That's quite simple. Um, yeah, um, that's capacitors basically. Um, one application, the final application that you'll find for these things is in the hobby is as an alternative to a battery. Now, if you go out shopping for Christmas presents this year, you'll probably find little airplanes, electric planes that you can charge up. They take 20 seconds to charge or, you know, less than a minute to charge and they fly for 20 seconds or so. And a lot of people, I, I saw talking to a guy the other day who said, gee, they must have a good battery in them. I said, no, they've actually got a capacitor. They've got a super cap in them. It's a capacitor with so much capacity that it will hold enough power to drive the little tiny motor for 20 seconds, you know, and that's a lot of power, can, you know, going back a few years we didn't have super caps, you'd have to use a battery, but that's an example of using a capacitor in place of a battery. Another example of that is a growing number of electronic devices which have memory that must be kept active when you change the batteries or something. They used to use a little coin cell, and the little coin cells only last three years. After three years, when you went to change the batteries, all the memory was forgotten, and oh, sometimes it would just, a good example is perhaps the old JR radios. They had a battery to back up the the um, model memory, and the old JR9303s and things like that, 9302, I can figure it out. Anyway, those old radios had a coin cell on them. And after five years, the coin cell battery would often go flat. And then when you, uh, if you let the radio go flat, you'd get an error and you have to take it to the dealer and you'd have to fix it because you couldn't fix it yourself. But that sort of thing these days um, has, they've, instead of using coin cells, they often use super caps, which will keep something alive long enough to um, maybe you get a change of battery or something. Even some GPS receivers now have super caps so that if you're using it, turning it off and on during the day, it will remember its almanac from one operation to another. Some of them still use a little tiny lithium battery, but a lot of them are switching to super caps because lithium batteries don't last forever. Super caps virtually do. So it's just another use for capacitors in the hobby. So let's see if we can identify some of these capacitor types on common parts of the hobby, common components. This is a flight controller board. And these little orange things here and here and there and there, they're tantalum capacitors. They're a type of electrolytic. They use the tantalum metal instead of aluminium and a tantalum oxide. And I think there's some on the other side as well. And these ones here are obviously used as uh, smoothing capacitors, those reservoirs of capacitors, as we've talked about with the in the demonstration we, we did with the oscilloscope. So those are tantalums. Um, I don't, there's a couple of ceramics. It's a bit hard to see. Yeah, there's a couple of ceramics, I think and there's a tantalum. Um, tantalum is used because it's got a lot more capacity than the ceramic, and the ceramic is used because ceramics actually have a lower ESR. They, 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 can, they work better at high frequencies. Ceramics work good at high frequencies. So where you've got a power regulator, like this is a power regulator, you have some tantalums which uh, fill in the big gaps. So the low frequency uh, noise is handled by the tantalums, but the very high frequency noise it, these don't absorb it very well, so they use the ceramics, which handle high frequencies really well. So you not only get rid of any low frequency noise, but also high frequency noise. So these will be in parallel across that to get the best of both worlds, so to speak. And here's a 4-in-1 ESC, and on this we can see a range of various ceramic capacitors, but these ones down here, obviously you can see these are probably all in parallel to provide extra capacity, because if you put two 10 microfarad capacitors in parallel, you get 20 microfarads, they just double up, it's like when you put batteries in, in parallel, you increase the current capacity, will increase the capacity of a capacitor when you parallel it up with one of the same size. So, yeah, that's um, sometimes ESCs have a lot of capacitors to smooth out the noise, especially the older ones. I'll see if I can find an older style ESC, show you what I mean. And here is a blast from the past. This is, <laughs> let me pull out a bit here on this so you can see. This is my old MXP 230 with six inch arms and props. And the ESCs used back in the old days, you can see on these old, what are they? Um, I don't know what brand they are. But uh, you can see on these old ESCs, you've got two honking great electrolytic capacitors here across the battery input voltage to try and get rid of the noise that these things create. Massive great electrolytics. But old school these days, you'd probably use um, some really good ceramics to do that. But you, sometimes you still get uh, electrolytics that'll do the job. I know 
For example, here's a Dell RC uh, Forum 1. And let me just pull out a bit so I can show you. This is a Forum 1 ESC. And they come, they actually provide an electrolytic in the package here. Here we go, if I can get it out. There you go, come on. There's a low ESR electrolytic. Let me pull in a bit because it's all a bit far away. I've pulled out too far. Hang on. Ooh. That's a low ESR electrolytic that you can pop across the ESC to get rid of any noise that's created by it. And it's part of the part of what you get in the box, basically, with that 4 one speed controller. And here's a video transmitter. It's a Foxy, a 200 milliwatt video transmitter. And you'll notice there's a lot of capacitors here, all in parallel. Ceramic capacitors here, again, in parallel. And I notice on this one there is a place here for a component that hasn't been used. That's probably where they would put a tantalum capacitor, um, but they probably found they didn't need it with all these ceramics, so they just left it off. Saves a cent here and there when you're making thousands of these. It adds up to a bit of dollars in the long run. So yeah, these are just for power smoothing. You can tell here's the power supply. This is what drops the voltage down from the input voltage, which in this case can be, I don't know what it is, DC up to 24 volts. That'll drop it down to the 5 volts or so that the circuit uses. And having done that, it, it drops it down by chopping it up. And once you've chopped it up into little pulses, you've got to fill in all the gaps. So they put these capacitors here to smooth out the very, very noisy output of this switch mode regulator. So they're just acting, again, as reservoir caps. And I've used ceramics because ceramics are very good. This is a very high frequency switch mode power supply. It may even be as high as a few hundred kilohertz. And the ceramics work really well at high frequency. So they probably didn't need this tantalum. But if they've just used the tantalum, probably wouldn't have worked so well because the high frequencies would have still been passing through. They, the, these tantalum is not very good with very high frequencies. Ceramics are. So there you go. That's another more capacitors in an everyday device. And finally, here's a four in one or four button charger. Sorry, here's a four button charger. Button, 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 button. I've taken it out of the box so you can see because I'm repairing it. And you'll notice, look at the size of that electrolytic capacitor. That's a huge electrolytic capacitor there. And there's those... Uh, little score marks on the top. Huge electrolytic capacitor because this is handling quite hard, large currents. You know, it'll charge up to six or seven amps or something. So you need to put a lot of capacitance across that in order to get the noise taken out. We've got a little, um, somewhere in here there'll be a switch mode uh, regulator that we're stepping the voltage up. There'll be a boost buck regulator and that'll have a really noisy output. So what you do is you put a big capacitor on it to smooth out all the noise, to fill in all the gaps on the noise. Another capacitor over here for something, for probably for the regulator for the uh, digital circuitry. So yeah, that's what you get on there. Um, not much else in the way of capacitors. There's a few ceramics probably hidden in there somewhere, but yeah, that's a use for your electrolytic. So that's it for another Tech Tuesday. I hope I have not bamboozled you too much, and I apologise to people who say, yeah, that's not quite right, because I always take liberties to make things easier, try and explain the concepts to you in a simple way. So that's capacitors. Essential building block. We may do some experiments on the bench. Uh, when I've done, I'll also do, I think I've done if I've done resistors. I think I did Ohm's Law. Uh, but I may go looking a bit more at resistors if I haven't done that. And we'll look at inductors. Because when you start putting these things together, you can do some really cool stuff. And of course, semiconductors, transistors, FETs, that sort of thing. That's a really important issue as well. And you don't have to know how to use them, but it really helps to know how they work and what makes them work if, so that you can understand um, better if something goes wrong or if or why they're even there at all. So that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. Questions, comments in the usual place. I'm sorry this was a bit later than usual because I did this video two days ago and I forgot to turn on my microphone. Is it working now? Hello, hello? Oh, it is good. <laughs> Great. Yes, so frustrating when that happens. Trust me. Anyway, so I've had to do it again. So this is actually Tech Tuesday for the 6th of November, 2018 on the 8th. Work it out for yourself. Tech Thursday. There you go. That's it. Thank you for watching. Got to go. Things to do. Bye for now. Okay, now I'm going to show you about the way that we can extract the AC. If this was a signal on top of a DC, because remember, zero volts is way down there. Um, how do we just get that AC? How do we block the DC? Well, I'm going to use a capacitor here in series with my oscilloscope probe, and that will effectively stop the DC, but it'll let the AC come through. So let's just disconnect that for a moment, put that onto there, and I touch this onto here, and there it is. There's that signal still, but there's no voltage on it. It's just the AC part of that because I've got a capacitor in series with that thing. It's blocked the, the DC current, the DC current's disappeared, but the signal is still there, just as I mentioned on the whiteboard. Must be true, you saw it on the oscilloscope. Yeah, I just got it resting on. Here we go. Ah, who cares? <laughs>